podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. Uh, so we will be exploring lamb tonight, or use tonight, sheep production. It's great to have you on board. Uh, my name is Peter Havillant, and I work with Webinar Coordinators Aggregate Consulting. The title of tonight's webinar is The Importance of Mineral Minerals for Use at Lamy, and we're lucky to be joined by Dr. Colin Trengove of the University of Adelaide. Um, so most of you know the deal, but uh, for those new, I'm just going to quickly step through some of the functionality aspects of the webinar. Uh, apologies, wrong slide, I will go back. So, uh, on housekeeping, if you're not familiar with GoToWebinar, uh, your control panel there is on the right and you can minimise that with the arrow. That way uh, you won't have any interruptions to the slide view uh, when Colin starts his presentation. You'll also notice on the right that you have um, a question uh, box, so that'll, that'll be submitted to me. Um, if you have any technical difficulties with accessing sound, again, you can send me messages. So uh, the other thing we make clear is we, what we value your feedback with these events. Um, at the end of the webinar or when you exit, you'll be asked to complete a survey. We really appreciate the two minutes it takes to do that. Okay, so that's housekeeping covered for tonight. As I said, our presenter is Dr. Colin Prengove of the University of Adelaide and a little bit on Colin. So he's a lecturer at, at the school, again, apologies there, at vet, uh, the Veterinary Science School uh, in the, from the Rosewood campus. And he also runs a consulting business. Uh, so obviously with these events and, and providing advice to, to clients and industry on livestock topics. So he's had a, a pretty expansive career, 42 years, uh, including primary industries, mixed veterinary practice, and obviously livestock consultancy and academia. So obviously we've got him in here tonight because of his current research focuses, which include macro and trace element nutrition on lambs and steers. Um, we will also have a follow-up webinar uh, complementing this on lambs and mineral supplements in uh, in, the, in the near future, so not next webinar, but the following. Uh, I think that's enough of an intro from me tonight, so I'm going to hand over to Colin, and at, you know, don't wait till the end of the presentation. Feel free to send through your uh, queries as they arise. Colin, I'm just going to share that, uh, make you the presenter, and if you're right, I will go on mute. Okay, yep, <clears throat> right to go, thank you. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, Peter, and uh, thank you to uh, MLA and uh, Aggregate Consulting for the opportunity to uh, present this evening. Uh, very informal, so uh, happy to have a discussion about any issues. Uh, as the intro suggested, uh, trace element nutrition has been dear to my Heart for a long time. I started my employment um, at uh, Port Augusta and then Port Lincoln over on the east coast or the west coast of South Australia, which is uh, Air Peninsula, back in the eight, early 80s. And uh, trace element efficiency was quite prevalent then. So I developed an interest which uh, never left me when I went down the uh, southeast to Narra Court for 20 years. Uh, plenty of trace element problems down there. So I think South Australia is a bit of a home of trace element efficiency, but I see, well, I'll present evidence, I guess, tonight that it's a, a bigger issue than just uh, in South Australia. Okay, so starting off, if my screen gets going, radio. So starting off with the end in mind, um, so the relative importance of nutrients. So I've taken this from the uh, MLA nutrient nutrition edge, uh, and it just highlights the relative importance of different uh, nutrients in the diet. And so uh, often people get this pyramid upside down and tend to uh, the mineral mania where people get focused on trace elements and, uh, and forget 
get the big picture, which is obviously the energy and protein, which are the ones that are most likely to be deficient most of the year round if uh, if it's not addressed. But of course, uh, we can see here that uh, calcium, uh, copper, zinc, uh, and uh, vitamin trace minerals do do play a significant role. Another uh, little quote puts this in perspective. So Neville Subtle, who's a, a sort of a world leading or has been a world leading trace element nutritionist, uh, made this statement of saying that seven possible reasons for poor growth in lambs, I've modified that a bit, he said in livestock, in young livestock, <clears throat> in order of probability. So insufficient dietary energy or protein, uh, basically maternal or you under nutrition, infectious disease, environmental stress, so that's hot, cold, wind, rain, etc. Poor genetics, so not using your Australian sheep breeding values. Uh, and then you get down to perhaps one or two mineral deficiencies. Uh, and so just putting that in perspective before we uh, launch into talking about the need for trace elements in the, uh, the late pregnant ewe. Another consideration, of course, uh, when we're talking about uh, late pregnancy or point of lambing is uh, when is that for different people? And of course, uh, people coming from various backgrounds that could be all over the place. So uh, essentially we want to match feed supply and demand and, uh, and the key to that is actually getting the light time of lambing right. So we really want to minimise the need for supplementary feeding because that costs you 10 times more than what you can grow in the paddock. But the other consideration is we also want to have weaners that uh, are heavy enough to um, turn off at the end of the season or that can be retained as, uh, as breeders in the coming year. So this uh, little graph here, which I've lifted out of the more lambs more often uh, workshop, just highlights that uh, Depending, and this is a situation, obviously a higher rainfall area, more than 600 mil rainfall, annual rainfall, and uh, the season ending in the, at the end of the year, end of December. So we see here that if you're really looking to grain finish lambs, that you'd be aiming the lamb around about uh, July. Uh, so you've got four or five months of green to potentially ahead of you. Um, store lambs, where you may aiming to turn them off, uh, lambing in August, so you've still got four months of green feed. Or if you're looking to retain lambs going into the next year, uh, you could lamb later still. So you might even lamb uh, in, in September when you've still got three months of green feed to get them up to that uh, weaning weight of around about 25 to, to 35 kilograms, depending on which um, bloodline or gen genotype you've got. Now, I've uh, cheaply uh, modified this graph for a lower, lower rainfall area. So if we say we've got less than 500 mil rainfall, uh, you effectively bringing all these um, suggested opportunities for lambing at four to a couple of months. And, and I certainly know here in the mid north of South Australia, where I tend to do a, quite a bit of operation, um, you know, people lamb as early as March, March, April. And uh, that's not necessarily fitting in with the matching the feed supply and demand, but it's more a case of trying to turn lambs off um, early in, in spring. So um, each to their own choice. So what is the role of minerals? So it provides structure. So minerals certainly play an important role in bone formation. Uh, and for that matter, deficiencies generally show up as uh, either brittle bones or, or bone fractures. Uh, they assist in neural transmissions. So that's basically all um, impulses through the nerv nervous system. So whether that's uh, determining their desire to start eating or stop eating, uh, the effect of the um, gut fill in terms of uh, feedback to the brain uh, and so forth. And then the uh, last significant role of minerals is to act as a catalyst in physiological processes. So whether that's processes within the gut, uh, within the liver, within the kidneys, uh, within the brain, uh, and for that matter, the connectivity between blood vessels and lymph vessels, etc. So they do play a really uh, important strategic role and too numerous to mention uh, in, a, in a simple presentation. So what are the factors that determine mineral availability first up? So uh, this is taken out of uh, animal nutrition by Phil Hind, uh, talking firstly about soil type, how it's a, a major impact on mineral availability. Obviously the uh, parent material determines the nutrient uh, uh, content and availability within the soil. Uh, also the uh, impacts the pH, which in turn determines the availability of a lot of the macro and trace elements. And the other consideration is that often this time of the year, depending on where you're located, uh, soil ingestion plays a significant role in mineral nutrition. So when often people think uh, mineral or trace elements are deficient in the summer autumn period, it's when feed is often short 
and sparse. And so sheep inadvertently are consuming quite a bit of soil. And that's actually quite a useful means of mineral supplementation. So uh, as we'll talk about a bit later on, mineral deficiency is more likely to occur in your green season rather than your dry season. Uh, Fertiliser history can play a role. That's probably more to do with micro elements though. We don't tend to necessarily put a lot of trace elements uh, in the fertiliser, uh, mainly because it's very expensive, but it, it can be that, that effect. Uh, climate obviously plays a role with uh, plant growth, both the species uh, and the, uh, the feed on offer. So how much is grown will be, is largely determined by the client, by the climate, should I say. Uh, the stage of plant growth, so um, early on plants are very mineral deficient because the root system is poorly developed. And then in the latter stages, as they go from maturity through to senescence, the um, mineral is often resorbed back into the root system ready for the um, following year, especially in the case of perennials. And uh, so yeah, the very mature plants also can be quite lacking in, in mineral content. The mineral form, so that affects the bioavailability. And so for example, when we're looking at doing supplements, uh, we might choose to use sulfate forms. So, so for example, copper sulfate or manganese sulfate or whatever, and they tend to be the least available but they're commonly used because they're also the cheapest form of um, mineral supplementation. Whereas the, uh, there's various chelate forms, which generally the chelates are designed so that the mineral is much more mineral availability. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. So plant species, generally we say uh, legumes are far more, have far more developed root system and so more mineral uptake and so more mineral available to uh, grazing and ruminants. Uh, perhaps the, one of the few exceptions to this is that grasses tend to take up more selenium uh, than do legumes. Uh, and then in, in contrast, you can have some species that actually accumulate minerals. And so there's a, classically, there are some selenium accumulators in Northwestern Australia, uh, where you can actually run into toxicity because of their ability to accumulate. Okay, so now what impact does that have on um, mineral availability? So pasture, if you do um, monthly pasture sampling and get it analysed for macro and trace elements. We see here that um, from the autumn break uh, through to late winter, that there's not a lot of difference in the availability of mineral. And that's mainly because the, um, whether it's a perennial species that's uh, uh, shooting up new tillers or whether it's an annual species that's germinated, that's certainly an annual species, the first six weeks, the nutrition is all coming from the the germ in the seed, in other words, it's not nothing to do with what's in the soil. But as the season advances, uh, the root system develops more. And by the time we get to, um, I'm really talking about obviously Southern Australia here, uh, get to late winter, around the mid-August period, that um, because the root system is now more established in the, whether it's a perennial or annual species, and uh, so more minerals are, is taken up. Uh, and so we tend to see this climb in, um, for example, manganese, copper, um, etc. Whereas the, um, those trace elements that are available in very minute quantities, such as selenium and cobalt, um, the scale of this uh, diagram means that they bobble along the bottom, but um, you don't need much of those to satisfy the animal's needs. So it's just highlighting that um, we're more likely to see trace element deficiencies develop um, in that early part of the winter period. Uh, as the plants get more developed, they tend to be less of an issue. Uh, and as I said, Prior to the autumn break, a lot of animals tend to be eating more soil, and so they're actually getting quite a, a reasonable supplementation at that time. Another confounding factor with the availability of uh, minerals in general is uh, the inorganic interactions. So generally, as a general rule, an excess of one mineral will always create a deficiency in one or more others. Now, I'm not gonna go through this uh, table in any detail, but I'll just focus on copper, cobalt, and selenium. So we see here in the case of cobalt, that um, high iron, uh, high manganese and high cadmium will reduce the availability of cobalt uh, basically to the animal. And, uh, and also low iron actually in, uh, improves the availability of cobalt. In the case of copper, there's a lot of mineral interactions which uh, reduce the availability. So regardless of how much is in the soil and available to the plant, that can be restricted by high molybdenum, uh, high phosphorus, high zinc, high calcium, high sulfur, and high cadmium. So there's a lot of competing agents. So just to say you've got a certain number of parts per million of copper in the soil, doesn't mean too much when you've got these other competing nutrients, which reduces its availability to the uh, grazing ruminant. 
and similarly but to a lesser extent with selenium that uh, high copper high uh, sulfur and uh, high cadmium can also reduce the availability of selenium and generally Australian soils are pretty lacking anyway in selenium. Knowing um, when trace element efficiency is likely to occur so I've already trust, uh, touched on this so we normally say that the uh, I guess the big three copper cobalt selenium and most likely going to be limiting from your uh, midwinter to spring bearing in mind that uh, if they've been eating soil through autumn often it will take two or three months to deplete those reserves that they've already got in the body especially with selenium and copper they're generally stored for at least a couple of months the body cobalt tends to be only stored for a week or so um, and then we have the uh, trace elements as well so generally vitamin a and e uh, and uh, are generally are uh, more associated with green feed so if you're grazing dry feed for two or three months that's when they become limiting and vitamin D uh, which has an impact a big impact on the availability of calcium in the body and hence the uh, skeletal structure uh, that can be limiting all year round depending on your latitude so it's generally said if you draw a line from Perth to Sydney south of there all livestock and for that matter people uh, can be amenable or at risk to vitamin D deficiency so what is mineral deficiency? Uh, so this illustration here is just to highlight that, and it's the same with crops actually, or pasture species, that uh, deficiency became quite established, quite well established before you pick it up visually. So highlighting here that if we're looking at the uh, mineral reserves in a ewe, for example, uh, if they're depleting over that um, after the autumn break, uh, we'll see that that firstly can have an Im impact on reducing the animal's immune status. That can then further have an impact on fertility and growth rate uh, and then by the time you get to see it clinically when you can see obviously the animal is um, slipping uh, it's already and so it's become a clinical disease as opposed to a subclinical uh, they've already uh, the Im impact on immunity growth and fertility is always already quite considerable so signs of mineral deficiency uh, i won't go through this in too much detail it's, it's not something you're going to commit to memory but it's just an interesting talking point so a number of trace elements have an impact on the immune status of the animal and hence their disease susceptibility so copper cobalt manganese zinc uh, sorry copper selenium manganese and zinc uh, some also impact on anemia so once again uh, predisposed to ill thrift and, and death so cobalt copper and iron poor conception rate a uh, number of trace elements play a role in that and further to that, uh, poor fertility is another legion of trace elements that impact on fertility. So we can see here, uh, as we're talking about trace element supplementation or needs for the late pregnant ewe, there are quite a few of these trace elements play a role in the, um, first of all, the uh, ewe's ability to conceive, but then to further carry the uh, fetus or fetuses through to full term. Poor growth rate, once uh, lambing has occurred, a number of uh, important trace elements involved poor appetite so classically low cobalt or vitamin b12 uh, impacts on uh, the animal's ability to consume and hence can predispose to ill thrift uh, depraved appetite so classically sodium deficiency or salt deficiency causes animal to animals to eat great gate posts and whatever else is around or bark off trees uh, but that's also impacted by phosphorus, uh, cobalt and copper. Uh, and bone defects uh, is the other one. So the number of elements uh, play a role in uh, predisposing to weak bones and bone fractures. Well, I guess the classic one is copper. Uh, and last but not least, milk yield. So once again, the impact of um, if we've got an U that's deficient in trace elements in that latter stages of pregnancy, it can have a significant bearing on the ability of the uh, or the milking ability and hence uh, the lamb or lambs to uh, survive thereafter. We do know what um, mineral content is required, mineral and trace element uh, in sheep and cattle and that's fortunate because we uh, essentially we design our various mineral supplements whether it's a lick or a block or a um, injection or an oral drench uh, all based on what we know should be uh, the animal should be receiving but we need to look at what they have received and so you can either do a blood test or a liver test to work out what their current mineral status is or to a lesser extent perhaps a, um, a pasture analysis looking at the uh, mineral content of the pasture that can give us a pretty good idea whether uh, these animals are likely to be subjected to um, deficiencies
So that's, um, I guess, for background to know that uh, when we're designing rations uh, and including immunoral content, we do know what animals should be receiving at different stages of their uh, physiological and, uh, and life cycle. Okay, so moving into uh, perhaps four of the uh, trace elements that we uh, get more concerned about. So firstly, selenium. So we know that Australian soils are very old and weathered, and it's argued that most of the Australian soils are pretty well selenium deficient, and hence uh, a large proportion of the human population are probably selenium deficient without um, taking supplements or your Brazil nuts or whatever you might do. So areas that are especially receiving uh, above moderate rainfall are more susceptible because soils become leached in the higher rainfall areas. So selenium, it may already be lacking, but it's further reduced by leaching. And uh, it can also become limiting when you've got uh, above end at above average rainfall. So when you're having a, a good year, a good spring, often selenium is uh, more restricted or, or less selenium spread over more feed on offer. Uh, and typically, uh, as the distribution shows here, they occur in the coastal areas, as do most of our trace element deficiencies especially on the uh, sandy, acidic and granitic uh, soil types. What do we see with selenium deficiency? Well, it's uh, a major component of glutathione peroxidase, which is an antioxidant. Uh, you've probably all heard about antioxidants and uh, they play a critical role in protecting the body from, um, I guess, damage from radicals, which are a natural product of our metabolic processes, of our ovulation, uh, milking, uh, uh, wool growth, etc. You tend to have um, free radicals uh, as a byproduct of uh, those processes. And so you need to have antioxidants to um, mop them up and prevent them from doing cell damage. So it highlights us here that um, a free radical, uh, we see here the copper, zinc and manganese play a role as an antioxidant. Uh, and certainly so does selenium as a glutathione peroxidase enzyme. Uh, and so without those, um, we'd, we'd suffer a lot more, I guess, uh, issues associated with trace animal deficiency. And so those that can be poor growth up to 18 months of age uh, and muscular dystrophy. And so this illustration here is a lamb that's on a um, clover rich pasture that um, was fertilized with gypsum. Uh, sulfur competes out the, uh, the selenium. And so this animal is suffering from muscular dystrophy. It's able to crawl around on its knees and uh, eat the pasture within Kui, but um, not able to walk away until it was given a selenium injection. So you also see uh, lowered fertility, embryo loss, one of the various reasons that uh, we do see embryonic loss. Uh, scouring and ill thrift is a consequence, may see sudden death, um, mastitis, reduced milk production, retained fetal membranes are all recognised as a consequence of uh, the selenium's um, uh, deficiency resulting in uh, increased disease susceptibility. Moving on to copper, so sandy coastal soils with poor organic matter, once again, similar distribution to selenium, but just a bit more widespread, extending further into Queensland. Uh, and once again, associated with uh, acid soils, granitic soils, but also um, sands and silts and swamps, uh, and tends to be a bigger issue in higher rainfall areas. Uh, and bearing in mind that copper is also um, bound up by sulphur and iron uh, and uh, Molybdenum. So wherever people have put that out as a, um, a fertilizer supplement, uh, you're increasing the risk of copper deficiency occurring. So you may have put out copper as fertilizer, but it's no longer available because it's uh, tied up by say molybdenum. The consequences, so it's involved in iron transport and so the development of the, the heme unit um, in the hemoglobin. And so if we have a deficiency of copper, we end up with an anemic animal uh, and so weak uh, poor do that uh, we'll probably end up dying if it's not uh, dealt with. Uh, copper is also involved in the enzyme tyrosinase, which is associated with uh, the pigmentation and, and strength. Uh, so for example, in uh, wool fibres become weak with no crimp uh, and so described as being steely, so lacking character. And also we can see here the impact of copper supplementation versus copper deficiency, where the um, normal black pigmented fibre actually becomes almost white uh, without the um, adequate copper in the diet. The other impact is that it can reduce the uh, myelination of the uh, spinal cord in the latter stages of pregnancy. So lambs are born with sway back and in other words, they, they walk around with a stagger 
uh, and that can may not be evident at birth, but may develop some weeks later. Uh, and the, the inevitable uh, consequences uh, can be diarrhea as a secondary impact, and also weak bones, as we discussed before. So copper is involved in the uh, collagen matrix within the bone marrow. And so without um, adequate copper intake, we end up with uh, rib fractures and, uh, and spiral fractures in the uh, long bones. So it can be quite a problem, especially across um, southwestern Victoria, southeast South Australia. Okay, so how do we diagnose copper deficiency? I picked on this one because it is a complicated one. We don't get to uh, dwell too much on it. So if we talk about liver copper, plasma copper, and red blood cell copper, uh, so liver, so 95% of the copper in the body is stored in the liver. And uh, as we see, as you go into that after the autumn break, often the feed is uh, lacking in copper, depending on rainfall, pasture type, and interactions with things like molybdenum. But if you want to work out whether you've got a deficiency at this stage, you would normally do a liver biopsy. Because by taking a sample of liver out of the animal, and you can do that in a live animal quite simply, um, just some people don't do it because they're not confident with it, but a little bit of liver, uh, gives you an up to the minute picture of the status of that animal. So in this case, um, it's already gone down the slippery slope and so these animals are, would be deficient in liver copper. But if you looked at liver plasma, uh, sorry, plasma copper, in other words, the copper floating around in the blood system or in the red blood cells, you'd see that it's still an adequate amount. So it's still adequate, whereas it's already marginal at this stage. So if we wanted to do a blood test, to look at uh, copper availability, you'd have to go much later in the year, so probably towards the end of winter, um, because 70 to 90% of the copper in the plasma uh, can hang around for a month after the liver is depleted. And furthermore, um, it can hang around for two or three months in red blood cells. And so you, if you're going to do a um, another blood test, that's looking at clotted blood, this is looking at a preserved uh, uh, anticoagulated blood sample, you'd need to look at it in spring, otherwise it's going to give you a false result uh, if you go any earlier with a blood test. Okay, moving on to cobalt deficiency. Once again, coastal issue associated with sandy soils and granitic soils here across Western Victoria, uh, and also uh, can be tied up by uh, <clears throat> calcium, so high pH soils, limestone countries where you're more likely to see Copper deficient, cobalt deficiency. Cobalt is a component of the body B12. And so often they uh, talk about it in the same breath, but uh, vitamin B12 is what we have in the animal's body. Cobalt is what's in the diet or out in the, in the soil or the pasture. So what we see with a, um, if we get a cobalt deficiency, you end up with vitamin B12 deficiency and end up with once again an anemia, which happens the animal and can cause death. It also is a primary function in the uh, TCA or Krebs cycle, the main energy system in the body. And so you end up with a, a loss of appetite or anorexia if you've got cobalt deficiency. Uh, consequently, you'll get ill thrift and uh, weak wool, once again, that deprived appetite. Uh, you can see ocular discharge, what we call a remy eye. And so this animal here, for example, all that tear staining around the eye, a bit like a poodle. Uh, typical of uh, cobalt deficiency. And uh, you may also see a white liver disease, which then predisposes to photosensitization and scaly ears. And so this lamb here is actually suffering from cobalt deficiency and the subsequent impact on of photosensitization where we've got scaly ears, uh, scaly crusty face. Um, and so it's got the, uh, the whole lot. And sometimes you may even see blindness and convulsions similar to a B1 deficiency. Thiamine deficiency. Okay, so uh, bottom B12 deficiency results from an ina inadequate cobalt intake. Uh, and so typically when pastures of growth is lush, um, <clears throat> and if only because there's less so soil being ingested, and so eating lots of lush pasture, which is quite can be quite low in cobalt. Uh, and so you'll pick it up because animals that should be growing fast just in spring are actually uh, far behind the weight ball, uh, eight ball. So what are the risks? So newborn uh, are at risk because colostrum quite, is quite, often quite low in vitamin B12. Um, it's a higher risk in weaners than adults. Sheep and goats are, are similar at risk and much more so than cattle. So a, a footnote here is that um, generally if ewes are deficient in any trace element, they'll pass that on to the uh, lamb. Whereas the um, 
cattle, uh, often the cow may be deficient in a trace element, but they still are able to push enough out into the calf to um, for the calf to be born with sufficient quantities. Iodine deficiency, I thought I'd cover off, especially since there's been a pretty wet time in the east of late. Uh, and so this uh, old illustration from Ivan Capel's book back in the 80s, uh, of trace element deficiencies in Victoria. So highlighting here that um, where the zeros, that represents some um, uh, iodine deficiency in lambs. The open stars represent um, iodine deficiency in kids goat kids, and then uh, the solid stars represent iodine deficiency in calves, and then the odd square represents deficiency in foals. So it highlights that um, iodine plays an important role across a number of different species and can be quite widespread, but especially more so in your above average or wetter, wetter years. So not uncommon here in central northern Victoria uh, and, and, and moving up in through the Great Dividing Range. So what uh, iodine deficiency is a component of the thyroid herm hormones. And so a lack of those results in hypothyroidism. Uh, and the consequence is um, lethargy, a low metabolic rate um, and hypothermia. So inability to keep your main your body temperature up and goiter, which is this enlargement of the uh, hyperactive thyroid gland because of the iodine deficiency, it goes into overload. And uh, it can be readily diagnosed in a dead lamb by weighing the thyroid in relation to the body weight of the lamb. So for example, I think it's 0.4 of a gram per kilogram of body weight. So if you've got a four kilogram lamb, uh, you should have a thyroid that's no more than 1.6 grams or otherwise that's indicative of a goiter. So we see here um, consequences of hair loss, reduced wool growth, uh, reduced live weight, reproductive failure, reduced immunity, uh, and a high neonatal mortality. So a lot of lambs die in thyroid deficient use um, in those wet years. So now just uh, taking a step back and talking a bit more about um, the problems we may see with uh, antioxidants. So there's a couple of different enzymes here, uh, amyloid and uh, glutathione deficiency vitamin A, vitamin E deficiency, which we tend to see in those summer months as we referred to earlier, or if we've got low zinc or selenium or manganese or copper, uh, these are all a high risk to cause embryogenesis uh, defects. So in other words, developing fetus not developing properly or fetal growth problems, or even for earlier on, difficulty with spermatogenesis and ovulation. In other words, poor sperm development or poor ovulation uh, as a result of having these um, vitamins and uh, trace element deficiencies. And then later in the year, we can see the impact of low selenium and copper, which is when we're most likely to see it. High polyunsaturated fatty acids associated with clover pastures um, and a higher risk of gastrointestinal parasites because that's what we normally see in winter. Uh, and so that can have a big impact on uh, parturition, so birth uh, and lamb growth and rapid wiener growth. I'm conscious of time here, I better not um, Keep talking for too long. So uh, here, just talking briefly about bioavailability, I mentioned earlier that depending on the form of the mineral as to how available it is. So for example, if you give a lamb a copper sulfate drench, even less than 1% may be absorbed. Now you don't need a lot of copper, fortunately, to um, suffice or provide the animal with enough copper for a couple of months. But in a different bioavailable form, so for example, copper in milk, uh, fed to lambs, uh, obviously used milk, uh, can be 70 to 85 percent available. So far different from a, an inorganic a supplement. Similarly with manganese, very little can be may be available through a, say manganese sulfate. Some, uh, zinc and selenium are generally more available in the um, organic forms. Uh, and then there's all these other reactions, other minerals, trace elements, which can reduce the, further the availability of these. So just not the uh, form that they're in, but also competition from other elements, which makes uh, formulation of rations um, a very inexact science because it's very hard to pick what um, interactions may re be reducing the availability of what you put in the diet. So what can we do about it? So there's a range of different products on the market, um, too numerous to go through here, but uh, just to bear in mind that whether it's a bowl, a pellet, a liquor drench, an injection folder, a fertilizer or water, uh, water medication, um, 
there are various forms available. And uh, so some might have provided benefit less than two months, for example, generally lifts and drenches. And a lot of the injections are only a generally sort of six week benefit and even foliar application of the pasture or a um, water medication. So generally that's why water medications are often administered at least every six weeks. Uh, the benefits that last longer uh, would be those that are in a depot formulation. So it's a slow release. Uh, and so that may be the case uh, in the injections and some foliars may have a more persistent effect. And then we can have pellets uh, or for that matter boluses, which uh, may have a benefit for longer than 12 months and even some fertilizers if it's uncomplicated by other interactions. So some uh, products are not suitable for using in lambs less than two months of age. So for example, boluses and pellets, you're more likely to choke the lamb, whereas these other, these other formulations are, are no problem. And some boluses or more so pellets may become coated with uh, calcium carbonate depending on the soil type. And so you may need to put two pellets in there or a grinder to knock off that, uh, that coating of limestone around the pellet. Some also provide vitamins A, D and E. And uh, there are a risk of those mineral interactions that we've talked about you know, with a lot of these products. So for example, licks um, and for that matter, potentially lot blocks uh, foliars and fertilizers, there can easily be um, interactions which, whilst you've put an adequate amount in the fertilizer, it means it's rendered unavailable to uh, to the animal. Oops. Uh, and so uh, I thought I'd just finish off with a checkbox list of um, considerations. Uh, so a lifetime youth group a couple of days ago suggested this would be a good idea. So um, what do we need to uh, think of uh, prior to lambing? So establishing what the mineral availability or status is to those used in that paddock. So that's where having a knowledge of the soil test to know what minerals are, are available and what interactions may be occurring. So you might do that sometime in the preceding 12 months or even a soil test from two years ago is usually still relevant. Uh, generally, if you ensure the ewes have an availability of at least a tonne of dry matter on offer, um, that's uh, generally meaning that they're probably getting enough, uh, even if it's um, not much better than cardboard, it's still got some mineral content in it and uh, and so that can stave off the problems with some deficiencies that we may see and so they really should have at least a, a ton of dry matter on offer now we talk dry matter but whether that's actually in the green state or the dry state um, having an abundance of feed on offer is important for um, obviously soil um, preservation but also to provide some nutrition to the animal and as i said they're probably often eating um, if it's in the dry period they'll be eating some mineral through soil anyway a plant tissue test, if, if you do have green feed available at that time, around about day 90 after scanning, uh, it's a good opportunity to then look at what mineral availability is in the green feed. And so you can make some estimates uh, about the likelihood of deficiencies occurring or not occurring. Uh, if in doubt, you can always do a, a blood or a liver sample on 10 ewes uh, at a similar time to establish whether there is a need for particular supplementation uh, and the other one is uh, always doing regular condition scoring and, and feed budgets to ensure that essentially that, that or primarily you've got enough energy and protein for the, uh, the ewe and, and lamb combination. So ideally you should be condition scoring about every six weeks through pregnancy because things can change quite dramatically, especially if um, you don't have much green feed on offer. So how do you address this? So mineral supplementation and feed supplementation according to needs. So as we've just talked about all the different combinations that may be suitable in your circumstance, but that's something that you really need to uh, work out, perhaps in consultation with your uh, animal health advisor or agronomist. Okay, I might uh, finish up there. Thanks, Peter. And uh, see if there's any questions out there. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, very insightful and uh, very comprehensive. So um, we will get into questions. I'll just grab, I'm going to put up a screen for everyone to see, which has got a little bit of information on further actions um, and resources. So before I get hand over to you for questions, Colin, I'll show, um, answer a quick couple myself. Um, we've been asked about slides, resources, etc. Unfortunately, we don't make those available, but every webinar is recorded and can be accessed here. 
So I've got that link up at the bottom there. Um, and then obviously Colin touched on some of the, the other resources around sheep and uh, ewe management. There are, those links are up on screen as well. Um, so first question, I guess, for you, Colin, is going to be, what's the best way for farmers to determine which minerals are deficient in their use, especially when we're talking subclinical cases? Yeah, so it really comes back to uh, the time of lambing. So if you're lambing down um, before the um, <clears throat> green peas on offer, uh, you really um, the only reliable source is to do a liver biopsy. Now, I appreciate that there's a lot of um, or vets, uh, and for that matter, any um, animal health um, people out there probably are not competent in doing liver biopsies unless they've actually seen it demonstrated and how to go themselves. It is quite a useful procedure. Um, it's, it's not really an animal welfare concern. It's just a, it's a very very small um, uh, biopsy instrument inserted in through the rib cage, about the, about half the diameter of a biro, and uh, you just take a little piece of liver out. And that can give you the um, the immediate copper, cobalt, selenium, manganese, zinc uh, status of the animal. If um, alternatively uh, a pasture sample, once again, if there's green feed on offer, that's useful. There's not much value in doing an analysis on dry feed because generally, as I said, it's very low in macro and trace elements anyway. Uh, if you're actually into the um, if you've got green feed on offer before you get to lambing, well, that's when you can do a plant tissue analysis. And so that gives you a, a comprehensive um, indication of the uh, a dozen or so minerals that are analysed in a plant tissue test. Uh, and so that is a reasonable predictor of the availability. But you've got to look at um, those interactions, for example, you know, copper interacting with sulphur or iron or molybdenum. Um, generally, what selenium is there is available, and generally what cobalt there is available. Uh, and also, you could be looking at your manganese and, and zinc and boron, etc. So, but you probably ne would need help with interpreting that with um, uh, your pasture agronomist or, or veterinarian or animal health advisor. So, they are the options. Uh, essentially, either a, a liver biopsy or a plant tissue analysis. Uh, a blood sample is also useful, but more so if they've been on green feed for at least two to three months. Because what happens is the animal's um, mineral status is slowly depleted on green feed. And so, as I said, copper can remain elevated in the body for two months, even though the liver is depleted. And, uh, and so really a blood test can be misleading. It's probably quite useful for selenium uh, and uh, zinc and cobalt, but um, not so much for copper until you get later into the like with a period when there's been at least green feed on offer for at least two to three months. All right, thanks, Colin. Great advice. Um, we've got a, mm -hmm. plenty of questions coming in, so if you're going to stick around um, or, or head off, please remember that survey, and um, yeah, we'll we'll address all the questions uh, that we can, um, and we'll stick around. So thanks everyone for your attention. Um, now, next question, Colin, will be best way. Um, we covered that. Sorry, wondering if any of uh, you have any experience with free choice licks for sheep. Um, so, can they choose what they need and self-regulate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an age-old debate. Uh, I think generally, from a scientific perspective, if we're saying, um, you know, is the uh, the anecdote evidence-based? Uh, the general opinion is that they don't have a, that discerning taste. I mean, certainly they, they suss out salt and hence why you generally with all your licks and uh, blocks for that matter, there's always a healthy component of salt in there because that's an attractant and also an appetite stimulant. Um, and of course, um, another appetite stimulant is putting in sugar or molasses into blocks and licks because that really uh, makes them hoover up those licks, which is not necessarily what you, you want to happen. But um, Look, I think uh, I've seen uh, sheep, for example, uh, hoe into a clay bank. Uh, and so often with clay, it actually has quite a good mineral content, uh, whether it's calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, etc. cetera. But um, so I have seen animals deliberately eat clay. And, and so I'm a, there's a lot of anecdote around the world about um, birds that fly to a particular quarry to, to uh, eat clay. So I think there are some components of the diet which animals do um, preferentially go for. 
But in terms of whether they can discern zinc deficiency from a copper deficiency from a manganese deficiency, I'd have very, um, I'd be very dubious about that. So um, yeah, they might be able to um, suss out um, if there's a lot of salt there, or uh, for that matter, some organic components. Um, you know, whether you've got, for example, some silage uh, mixed in there as well. But um, yeah, I don't generally think that livestock can determine their specific needs for a trace element. They may feel a deficiency, and so that drives them to go and find a lick or a block or something, but not really discerning. Uh, and I know it has been in the past that people have put out different trace elements in, in a, um, I guess, in a, in a feed smorgasbord uh, to let them be discerning. But um, I am unaware of any evidence to support that. So in your answer there, Colin, you mentioned clays. Have you done anything with uh, kaolinite or anything like that with sheep? Well, certainly uh, often uh, kaolinite uh, is put into diets. Uh, it's actually counterproductive in terms of mineral nutrition. So often they'll put clays uh, per se in, in, in a diet to mop up or limit the uh, risk of acidosis. So um, it's often included in uh, feedlot diets or confinement feeding. Uh, so what happens there is that it uh, reduces the risk of uh, acidosis. And uh, but the trouble is with clays, they actually absorb um, macro and trace elements. So when we say clay soils are, can be quite high in potassium or sodium or um, uh, magnesium or calcium, uh, that's typical of what clays do. They actually bind minerals, especially your positive, your cation, very closely. And so they do the same with a lot of your trace elements. So you, you copper, uh, selenium, etc., cetera, uh, can become bound up as a result of having a bit of clay in the diet. And so that can be counterproductive if you're trying to um, supplement them with those trace elements. Great, that's really useful, Colin. Uh, so I'll just, another one very similar, but um, rather than loose leak, we've got a similar question around multi-mineral leak blocks. The, the additional component is, are you aware of any animals, uh, you know, overdosing it, overdosing on minerals when they're ad lib, or will the animal simply pass out the surplus? Uh, look, as a general rule, uh, the formulators of the licks and uh, for that matter, the blocks are very careful not to exceed what is considered a, a daily intake. Uh, and so, you know, for example, a selenium, you only need um, you know, two parts per million uh, in the diet daily to more than satisfy their needs. And even with, co uh, with copper, uh, they need only need small amounts because it is actually, it stays in the body for a long period of time. Uh, unlike cobalt, which um, you, know, you eat today and they'll be deficient by Monday. And, uh, and so that's um, those different formulations, uh, generally the manufacturers are very careful. Uh, the other consideration is that they formulate them so that um, they generally won't eat too much, um, and especially uh, some of the liquid mineral supplements that are that are put around, where uh, they'll top up a container, you know, drive to your farm and top up your container weekly. Uh, depending on how quickly it's consumed, they can change the the, the buffering, the sugar to the acid content to um, increase the intake or to reduce the intake, uh, and so there are those those tricks. And of course, these days uh, with um, you know, motion sensors and uh, and cameras that you know GoPros and whatever you can put on animals uh, and various other sensors, you can work out how how often they're going to a lick uh, and consuming it. So normally we'd say you know, most blocks, for example, or a lick, they'd, they'd probably on average consume about 10 grams a day, whereas a beast might consume about 100 grams a day. Uh, but um, often you'll find that they feel like they've had enough. Uh, after a week or two, and then they may uh, reduce their consumption for a week or two. So there's that pulsatile effect. So unless it's a particularly sweet uh, supplement where the animals will just go back it until it's con all consumed, uh, and people then often regulate that by saying, okay, well, I'm only going to top up the, um, the drench container or the feed out cart uh, once a week. So they, they can eat, that's all they're going to get for the week anyway. But um, yeah, look, uh, the very low risk of toxicities with those sort of mineral, multi-mineral supplements. Uh, I think the main concern is if, if you then go in at, say, layer marking and give them a, a, a drench of um, selenium or a copper injection on top of what they've already had in the paddock, you know, that increases the risk. Okay. But uh, as a general rule, I'd say those um, multi-mineral 
uh, supplements have provided uh, in the paddock at uh, very low risk. And, and say, I might also add, same with water medication. Uh, once again, they only put um, relatively small doses so that um, because you know that they're going to be getting a, a reasonable repeated availability. And so you make sure you don't put too much selenium in the water to cause a, um, a toxicity. Sure. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, would chicory play an impact in cobalt or have an impact in cobalt deficiency with photosensitivity? Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, deep tap-rooted plants um, and like chicory uh, being a herb uh, is, a, is a very good nutritional supplement. And generally, those plants with a more developed root system, uh, the likes of you know, safflower, uh, chicory, uh, lucin, even dock, um, because they've got a well-developed root system, they generally take up more uh, trace and macro elements than your your pasture grasses. Uh, so they can be a, quite a good supplement for providing um, extra trace element. And uh, so, for example, with uh, photosensitization, the um, the issue there is um, if you've got an adequate zinc in the diet. Unfortunately, zinc is uh, one that you can give five times the recommended dose and you won't cause any problems. Zinc actually protects the liver. And so animals that are on a high zinc diet are less uh, less susceptible to, um, for example, photosensitization. But um, yeah, as a general rule, deep tap-rooted plants uh, like uh, chicory are a very good source of um, minerals as well. Great. Uh, next question, does stress such as transport and weaning increase trace mineral uh, demand and, and by how much? Yeah, well, stress is a huge grab bag, um, which we say plays a major role in, you know, in all aspects of our health as well as uh, livestock health. And, uh, and certainly uh, animals do get, even though we don't perceive it, because uh, especially sheep being very stoic animals, you don't, they don't express pain. Uh, or stress very readily, but uh, whenever they yarded, uh, uh, driven uh, long distances, especially in dusty conditions, hot dusty conditions, uh, they do get quite stressed. And uh, and we know that um, environmental stresses such as heat, cold, dust, rain, uh, wind, all have a significant bearing. And if these animals are already, um, you know, for example, maybe a bit deficient in vitamin E in summer or selenium in winter, uh, their immune system is further compromised and so stress can easily tip them over the edge. Uh, so we certainly recognise that stress plays a huge role in, in animal and human health, uh, but because it's so multifactorial, in other words, there are so many different factors that, it, that impact on it, it's very hard to be uh, black and white in describing you know, um, the consequence of a particular action. All right. Um... Colin, we've got eight more questions going through, so we might we might try and keep the answers pretty concise. Um, and if there's further okay. follow up, we'll do our best to address it. So I, I, right. let's try and whip through these for everyone. Some 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 animals suffer from sore feet in spring. Is this mineral related or more protein related? Do you have any other insights there? Yeah, well, we normally say that uh, the horn of the uh, hooves is uh, impacted by uh, vitamin biotin and also zinc. Uh, and so that can have an impact on their uh, susceptibility to, for example, foot rot uh, and, uh, and just generally soft toes. Uh, but also we do know that high protein diets also predispose to um, uh, probably a bit like laminitis in the horse where they get increased blood supply or flow to the uh, lower limbs, and that can end up looking like they're sore-footed. And not forgetting also the fact that um, acidosis or grain overload causes uh, lameness for the same reason. You get a histamine release, that causes increased blood flow to the feet. But uh, we can also get a like a subacute acidosis even on, uh, on rich grain feed. So too much of a good thing can be a problem. So we do see lameness associated with um, especially a high legume diets, uh, very hard to reproduce when you want to do research on it, but we, we do recognise that as an issue. So it could be minerally related, but probably more likely uh, protein related. Okay. Um, use it lambing that don't seem to have milk or colostrum, but it comes in a couple of days after birth. Is that lactation related or mineral related? 
Yeah, look, I'd say, okay, that's primarily a hormonal issue. And it is sometimes hard to explain why um, oh, there's another term called ringworm where the um, the ewe is not dilated enough to allow the lamb to be lambed at the due time. So she's trying to lamb, but the, uh, for example, the, uh, the vagina is not dilated. Uh, and so, or should I say, the cervix is not dilated. So that really seems to be a hormonal control, which is not really well understood. Uh, now, whether that's, you know, it could well be a nutritional issue, could be a, a trace element deficiency. You know, for example, it wouldn't surprise me if selenium played a role in that, but I don't think that's really clearly established. Okay. Um, now, the best way to supply calcium during lambing for the U, is there merit in a high magnesium supplement during lambing? Uh, so there's a couple of parts to this question, sorry. That's part one. Next part mm -hmm. is, what, is there merit to giving high magnesium supplements during lambing to prevent, to prevent preg tox? Um, yes. So that you can so, you know, yeah. access those minerals out of their bones. Right, yeah. Yep. So the first point I want to make is that sheep aren't small cattle. Uh, and so uh, traditionally, especially in the dairy industry, people withhold calcium in the last six weeks of pregnancy stimulate the bones to release the calcium, bearing in mind that 99% you know, of the calcium in the body is stored in the bone. Um, but in the case of sheep, smaller bone animals, they don't actually have big calcium reserves. So they're still rely, heavily dependent on the diet to meet their daily calcium needs. There's a lot of calcium goes out in milk and there's a lot of calcium goes into uh, bone development in the fetus or fetuses in that latter, last six weeks of pregnancy. So I'm a firm advocate that um, you need to have a continuous calcium supplement uh, through the mid to late stages of pregnancy to ensure that uh, their needs are being met. And I think the turning on and off the bone calcium reserves is a, a relatively minor issue in the case of sheep. So, and the other thing is that um, they need to have their calcium reserves repleted um, in the spring. So they need to have an adequate amount of calcium and for that matter, magnesium in the spring diet. Now with regard to magnesium, that's generally only limiting if you're on a a, a quite a good green feed diet and so you're tending to look at perhaps the higher rainfall areas uh, where that's more likely to be needed to be supplemented whereas in your um, perhaps autumn to early winter lambing uh, sheep in lower rainfall areas uh, magnesium is rarely deficient uh, unless you're on particularly sandy soils uh, and, uh, and, and sorry you mentioned preg toxemia yes far away mate yeah so pregnancy toxemia is primarily um, uh, a starvation. In other words, they're lacking sufficient energy to meet their needs as the uh, fetuses are developing in the latter stages of pregnancy. So that's where it's really critical to condition, condition score, assess the feed on offer in the paddock and make sure that they're getting enough megajoules of energy every day so that they don't have to um, start using their body fat uh, in the latter stages of pregnancy because that's when they get um, preg toxemia. Uh, typically called twin lamb disease because anim animals with two lambs are, have got twice the burden on their energy uh, demands as what a, a ewe with a single lamb has, or even more so with triplets. So yeah, that's really a case of ensuring they're getting enough energy in their diet. And normally that will require, if they're not on green feed, they'll probably need some sort of grain supplement in the last um, four to six weeks of pregnancy. Great. Um, and I should also note for we've still got everyone sticking around. Uh, Colin is going to deliver another webinar. Uh, it, it's actually three webinars away, the sixth of April, and that will be on trace minerals for lamb growth. Um, so I'll keep firing away at you, Colin. We've got um, next one is can you comment just on on the risk around trace mineral toxicities? Is it high, low? Is there factors we should be aware of or conditions? Yeah, look, trace element uh, toxicities, there's really only selenium and copper. Uh, so all the other trace elements tend to be quite, uh, there's quite a wide margin of safety in the diet. Uh, and so yeah, you've just got to be careful that um, that's where you really do need to do either, well, a sort of pasture analysis to see the availability of copper in the feed that's, uh, the green feed that they're on. Um, or if you are giving copper supplementation, uh, probably ideally you should have done a blood test the previous spring uh, or a liver or a liver biopsy to work out what their status is and really because there's so much seasonal fluctuation in the availability of these minerals so for example most of the trace element deficiencies are more prevalent in your 
above average rainfall years, your wet years where you've got a profuse amount of green feed growing. And uh, so you need to do your due diligence on mineral availability across different seasons to work out, do you have copper deficiency every year or selenium deficiency every year, or is it only in those above average years where it's a problem? So supplementation in your dry years may not be necessary. And, and I do, I must admit, I do find plant tissue analysis when you've got at least uh, at least six weeks of green feed on offer, um, it can be quite a useful tool to um, look at the risk of um, deficiencies developing. Great. Um, and, and it's some really good questions here, Colin. So I'll, I'll, we'll keep, we'll, we'll, we'll limit it to probably another 15 minutes, guys. We are working through the list. Um, now, uh, next question. I normally offer a ground lime, so limestone salt mix to use if grazing a cereal crop. And and I, I guess there's there's a reference here to magnesium. Um, I'm assuming deficiencies. Is there anything else that, as an additive or a carrier, that can be you know offered, or do you have a suggestion for a better system? Normally, they. Uh, it's offered until they stop eating it. So obviously there is a feed refusal at some point here. Yeah. yeah, so especially if any animals are on a cereal grain diet, uh, they that's a must that they do get at least calcium. Now, as I said, salt is, uh, sheep do have a higher requirement for salt. So salt is there as a really is an appetite stimulant. Uh, so you normally would mix up your stock lime and, and salt together as a 50-50 brew. Or if you're actually are grazing winter cereals um, or in the higher rainfall area, then I'd be doing a third, a third, a third of, uh, say, salt, limestone, and either Coors Mag, which is magnesium oxide, or potentially um, Epsom salts, uh, so that they're actually getting some magnesium as well. So that, that's, uh, I think, especially when animals are on a green feed diet, that's critical, but it's also important if they're on a, if grain is representing more than 50% of their diet for more than six weeks in the lead up to lambing. Uh, it's essential that they do get uh, at least calcium and probably magnesium as a, as a bonus. Now, in terms of them, um, obviously you can add in other minerals as well, but that, that are probably the big ones in, in terms of the highest risk of deficiency developing. Uh, there's really, I don't think there's any uh, shortcuts there. I mean, you can obviously buy, a, there's a number of proprietary products which you can get off the shelf that are calcium, magnesium supplements that have got other trace mineral, minerals in there as well. Um, but if you want to mix up your own, well, that's right, that um, salt, cosmeg, and uh, limestone, a uh, third, a third, a third is, works quite well. That's um, uh, David Masters and, uh, and, and uh, Sean McGrath, et cetera, out of uh, CSU, Charles Sturt Uni. You've done a lot of work, work on that in, in gracing cereals and the, and the value of those supplements. Great. Um, and can you comment on the bioavailability of uh, subcutaneous injection versus oral supplementation for vitamin or trace? Yeah, look, I think uh, any formulation that's injected uh, is generally got a high bioavailability because they use the, um, I mean, there's a lot of research done on that, so we know what, what works best. Uh, and so generally, uh, injectable forms are quite highly bioavailable as well. And the fact is that by injecting it into the animal, you know you're getting it, uh, whether it's deposited into a lump of fat or into a muscle. But um, with the oral supplements, um, certainly that will vary depending on um, the, yeah, whether it's a sulfate form or a chelate form. There are a lot of um, you know, organic uh, chelates available, which also have quite good bioavailability and hence you pay correspondingly a lot more for them. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunately bioavailability is not one of those things that's published. In fact, it's very hard to find that data uh, in the in the literature, uh, and so that's why uh, there's a bit of sort of so so called muck and magic with mineral supplementation because uh, sometimes we don't really know how much is being absorbed. But the fact is that the uh, the body can often store it for a long period of time. So um, whether they're getting a little bit or a lot, um, uh, probably uh, just doesn't doesn't get noticed. Great. All right. Now, um, subclinical deficiency of copper. Do you think it's financially viable to supplement copper in a trading enterprise? 
in was it in a trading situation? Yeah, in a trading enterprise as opposed to a yeah, breeder operation. Yeah, so that's where I'd be very careful. Um, well, once again, um, I think a lot of um, scientists will say there's an over supplementation by megafold of, of all trace elements. In other words, a lot of people supplement um, thinking it's the magic bullet and often there's no deficiency there anyway. Uh, and apart from selenium and copper, that's not an issue because it just means um, you're creating expensive urine. But um, the uh, with the with uh, in a trading circumstance, you've obviously thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to buy in these lambs and sell them off in three months' time. Well, you, you could give any, an injectable or an oral form of copper, which is only going to last six or eight weeks, uh, and that's quite reasonable. But you certainly wouldn't give them a copper capsule or a copper bullet uh, that's going to last 12 months. So that's really where you've got to work out, um, firstly, do I have a deficiency that needs supplementing? Um, and I know a lot of, um, well, I won't, I won't sling off at stock agents, but a lot of um, uh, people in the sheep industry will just say, uh, Oh, give them, a, give them a shot of B12, you know, that'll stimulate appetite, stimulate appetite. Um, and that is to a certain extent, but if they're already getting adequate B12 or cobalt in the diet, uh, more doesn't actually improve their appetite. It just means it goes out in the urine. So you've really got to assess whether there is, is an issue of deficiency on your paddocks, on your property, uh, and then you decide how long do you need to supplement for to get these animals to market. Uh, and so, yeah, you can really, um, I mean, you'd probably just choose the cheapest option that's going to give you a benefit for the uh, time available. And so that can often be, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, to be crude, um, uh, one gram dose of copper sulfate uh, can be quite beneficial. Two, two grams will probably kill the lamb. So that's where you've got to be a bit careful uh, that you've actually got a deficiency to deal with. Whereas uh, vitamin B12, you can keep injecting as long as you like, and all it's doing is uh, pouring more out in the urine. Yeah, okay, great. Um, now, uh, can you comment on... Uh, sorry, I lost my spot there. There's so many questions here, mate. Um, can you comment on, you know, any minerals that are over-supplemented and... and, and you know, is there an impact in regard to interactions with other minerals? So is there competitive pathways there? I think the question is, Colin. Yeah, that's right. Well, certainly as I had that complicated a table I put up earlier, there are a lot of interactions. Uh, and so you can generally say, um, whether you're talking putting out fertiliser or a foliar or a liquor or a block or a oral drench, uh, you're always, whenever you put in too much of a mineral or minerals, there's always going to be competing out other minerals. Uh, and so that's why it gets very complicated. And, and so mineral supplementation is, is a grey area because of that. So we, we can predict a lot of the uh, interactions. And so that's why plant tissue analysis, for example, is quite useful to look at. You know, because if you've got a low copper and a high molybdenum, where well, you know the copper, these, these animals are going to be on a copper deficient diet, um, just based on the plant tissue test. But um, yeah, over supplementation of any mineral is likely to create deficiencies in others. Uh, and so that's why um, generally your licks and blocks, etc., are pretty carefully formulated. Um, but once again, I mean, the ideal is to formulate it based on a plant tissue analysis on your property, as opposed to buying you know, XYZ lick that is formulated for southern New South Wales or, or you know, Western Victoria. Uh, because that was really just assuming that all soils are the same and all pastures are the same, which is obviously not true. So um, you ideally would actually have a um, mineral supplementation program designed for your particular soil types. But, but yeah, that's more than probably what most people would go to. Okay. Uh, a very specific question related to lambs. So we'll, we'll, we'll still ask it to that tonight. Would a zinc supplement in, in a loose lick, and, and you know, loose lick includes calcium, magnesium, and salt, help prevent rape scald with lambs grazing or finishing on brassica crops? Uh, so does, does a mineral lick with those components um, yeah. prevent scald? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, look, I... To my mind, uh, the um, scold or what we technically call ovine interdigital dermatitis is a result of generally more a case of perhaps being in, in muddy conditions 
Uh, and and so what we're seeing there is, you know, if they might be just grazing in lush green feed or or actually particularly wet conditions, uh, and it's actually soil microorganisms which are normally in the environment uh, are able to penetrate the skin because it becomes soft and mushy, just the same as uh, you know, if we stood around in water all the time, uh, we'd be more prone to foot infections as well, especially if you're walking around in dirt which has got you know, billions of microorganisms. So the susceptibility to to my mind to uh, scald on, and for that matter foot rot just depends on what organisms are available and the environmental conditions. So it's well established that a lot of foot conditions whether it's foot abscess or foot rot or whatever uh, is associated with the uh, prevailing environmental conditions which includes moisture and sufficient warmth for microbes to um, survive and thrive. So if you're in cold soils you know, less than 10 degrees um, microbes usually aren't uh, very active and so it's not an, not an issue. Um, now, having said that, I'm sure that sometimes you can get that sort of acidosis circumstance where if the animals are on a particularly rich diet, you know, like a, a very rich um, uh, protein diet of um, legumes or potentially brassicas, um, where they may actually be getting a bit of that um, uh, founder or laminitis as a result of the diet they're on. So that can further, uh, I guess, predispose to foot foot conditions and lameness. So as a general rule I'd say most lamenesses are associated with the external environmental conditions but if they're on a particularly high energy high protein diet, shall we say a high octane diet, um, they are probably more prone to getting a bit of laminitis and so that's a, a founder or a lameness from within the animal. Okay, uh, fine. I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah. Great, no, great answer, Colin. Uh, final two questions, mate. Appreciate you sticking around. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, heliotrope with copper poisoning. Can you comment on that? Or helio uh, yep. heliotrope problems, I should say, with copper poisoning. Yeah. So we always expect to have a heliotrope, or common heliotrope, or potato weed, as we call it in South Australia. Um, so we always expect to see that in summer, um, most summers, but especially after significant rainfall, because that's probably about the only plant that often grows apart from cow crop um, in summer. And uh, so that can be an abundant in the paddock. And uh, you know, I've seen you know sheep grazing it uh, heavily stocked on potato weed. They just don't like it. It's not very palatable. And you rarely see uh, a, the, can, the problem, even though it does cause liver damage. Uh, so the pure lizard leading the alkaloid in uh, common heliotrope, uh, same as uh, Patterson's Curse or Salvation Jane, but that's uh, obviously a spring growing plant, whereas the um, heliotrope is in summer. And so you will get mild liver damage, uh, but that animal, if it remains on your property, may go through its entire life and you'll never see evidence of liver disease. But if that's animals move to another area that's notoriously copper deficient, someone gives them a drench of copper, uh, you can kill them pretty quickly. Because if you've got pre-existing liver damage and an animal gets a dose of copper sulfate or some other form of copper um, where all, all copper is stored in the liver and effectively if you've got liver damage, the um, ability to store copper might have been uh, reduced by 50%. And so uh, a dose of copper down the throat uh, may be just enough to, to um, you know, exceed the liver's capacity to store it. And then you get um, destruction of blood cells. And so the animal can die pretty quickly. Uh, and you'll see usually see evidence of jaundice. Look at their mucous membranes and they'll be quite yellow, uh, indicative of the liver damage that they've suffered. But uh, generally, if you've got um, animals in situ grazing heliotrope on, on your property, um, you probably rarely will see a problem unless you then give them a copper drench. Yep, no problem. All right, last question. Um, we see some behaviours around sheep eating tree bark, particularly in grazing crops like canola. Is that mineral related or any other insights there? Yeah, that, that's another, um, I guess, one one for debate. Uh, look, as we say, we call that picker when they eat the bark off trees. Uh, when I was based in the southeast Narracourt, we'd always see that in winter time when the short green feed is coming up, in especially on sandy soils on the um, on the ridge, sandy ridges. Uh, the animals would always go and attack the uh, gum trees and uh, 
and peel all the bark off them. Uh, and to my mind, that is uh, it's a combination of possibilities. One would be fibre deficiency because we know that short grain feed is really lacking in fibre, but it's also lacking in a lot of your macro and trace elements. So as we know, picker, in other words, the depraved appetite where animals will go and attack fence posts or trees or whatever, uh, we know that's associated with uh, phosphate deficiency, salt deficiency, uh, copper deficiency, and cobalt deficiency, um, and also just lack of fibre in the diet. So it could be one or, or any one of those combinations. Uh, but we generally see that more on your lighter soil types, on your heavier clay soils, uh, we don't tend to see so much um, animals attacking, uh, you know, trees or, or fence posts because generally there's enough mineral content in the um, clay soils that they never go looking for more. And so that inclines me to think that it's more a, um, a mineral related rather than a fibre related issue. All right, excellent. So thanks again, Colin, for sticking around and to our audience. Um, Please remember to do your surveys on the way out. We, we really value your feedback as, as previously stated. Join us again in two weeks. Uh, we'll have Sally Murphy from Inspire Ag and she's going to be talking about effective communication on farm. Thanks again, Colin, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.